Hey everyone, and welcome to this SANS webcast, Detect, Deny, and Disrupt with MITRE Defend. My name is Randall Jones. I'm the Offensive Operations Marketing Manager here at SANS, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Uh, today's featured speaker is Mr. Chris Crowley. Chris has been teaching for SANS for over 16 years now, and you can find him teaching SANS Security 511, Continuous Monitoring SecOps, and uh, as well as Security 575, Mobile Device Security. Uh, Chris also has his own consultancy, uh, Montance, where he offers a range of services and from incident handling, defense, uh, security ops, and a whole bunch of pen testing services, uh, as well as his uh, SOC class for learning um, how to build and run a security operations center, which you can find Chris teaching online in several events, including this year's Black Hat, I believe. Uh, so uh, if you have any questions for Chris uh, or Peter, as it were, um, uh, in the webcast, please enter them into the Q&A window at any time. Uh, he'll, they'll keep an eye out for those. Please note that our webcast is being recorded and will be available for viewing later in your SANS account under my webcast. And with that, uh, I'll let you take it away, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much, Randall. Appreciate the uh, the introduction. I, you know, it's it's surprising to me to hear 16 years. <laughs> I've been doing something consistently for 16 years. It's fascinating to me. Um, yeah, I'm actually not gonna I'm not gonna talk a lot today. I I invited Peter uh, Kalaramakis to uh, to come talk because. I love this project, and and those of you who have heard me talk in the past and, and know the stuff that I work on, you, you hear me frequently talk about uh, implementing rigor and analysis and using um, you know practices of methodology. And um, I, I try to develop things like uh, taxonomies and and lists and and supporting functions in order to give analysts the right tools in order to be able to. Uh, do the work that they need to do because it's it's difficult to develop the the context of a thorough complete understanding of all the things that might be possible in the world and then select between them while we're trying to uh, defend things and you know i'm i'm always looking at what other people are doing to that end and i found this project which came out of mitre and peter's going to talk about it uh, extensively in terms of some of the background and some of the applicability of it. So I don't want to take a lot more time. I know, Peter, you've got a lot of things that you want to talk about. You're going to give us a demo. You're going to show us that especially cool new, uh, you know, thing that you just added to the uh, Defend website uh, as part of that demo. So with that, I want to turn things over to Peter. Uh, tell us a little bit about you and the project and uh, how people can use it. Great. Thanks, Chris. And thanks for uh, the invite. I'm excited to speak to this community today. Um, so my name is Peter Kalaramakis. Uh, I work for MITRE Corporation. Uh, I've been there since 2017. And before that, I was actually building a, a commercial cybersecurity product that did malware detection on networks. Um, and uh, so I'm excited to get to talk about Defend today. Um, Defend's one of the projects I, I work on. Often at MITRE, we work on multiple projects. But Defend is, some, is, is unique because you know, we've been working on it for quite some time uh, and we just released it last year. So um, it's relatively new um, and we had a very small team working on this, but we had enough time and space to kind of really think about things. Um, so today I'm gonna give you basically an overview of Defend, uh, the motivation for the project, um, talk about what problem we were trying to solve, uh, talk about uh, how we actually built it um, and how it works under the hood, uh, where people are applying it. Um, and like Chris said, I'm also going to give a, a demo of some of the new features in the uh, web website that we released um, just yet, just uh, the, earlier this week. Um, and then we'll wrap it up with some discussion and closing thoughts and feel free to ask questions uh, along the way. So as I said, we started uh, building this project uh, about three years ago, and it was in response to the success of these offensive security frameworks, particularly attack. Um, once folks started to be able to characterize um, offensive TTPs in structured ways, there's an obvious need to characterize defense or what you're doing in response to those offensive TTPs in a structured way. So that was really the pitch for Defend is, hey, we need an equally structured way to think about defensive, defensive actions um, as we do on the offensive side. Um, so 
I will say it took us a while to figure out how to structure this. It is structured a, a bit differently than um, attack, if you're familiar with MITRE attack, um, but there are some similarities for sure. Um, like I said, we released it uh, last June, so almost a year uh, it's been out. And you, we were a bit surprised at the uh, response. There was uh, quite a bit of activity on the on the launch um and uh you know the nsa uh, is funding this uh so it's it's exciting to get to talk about this publicly um but it got picked up by a variety of media outlets uh and they wanted to do interviews and stuff like that um and uh you know that was that was a bit more than i was expecting initially um and uh one of the interesting things about this was that you know, we kind of hid an Easter egg in Defend. Um, behind the scenes is this formal model, which I'll talk about, and it's called an ontology. Um, and we didn't really put that front and center uh, because we wanted the tool to be sort of, you know, accessible and grab people's interest. However, the folks who were, who were uh, interested in that sort of thing found it kind of buried in the back uh, of the website and they're starting to build things on top of it. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, it's being used in a variety of places. Um, and in general, what I'll say is, you know, we're taking a long-term view with this. Um, we're trying to get, get it right in terms of, you know, designing it to make sure that it's sustainable for the community. It's cost effective to build this thing um, and it provides value. Um, so, you know, as you use this thing, understand that it's still early stage, you're going to find, uh, you know, rough corners and uh, but that's exactly why we've open sourced this. Um, we, we sort of want that feedback to help improve it, um, but it is being used. Um, so some examples, uh, uh, it's starting to be used in official government reporting uh, recently, actually, I think it was on the 7th of this month. A report was released by a joint report by CISA, NSA, FBI, uh, which was an update to their earlier report about Chinese state sponsored cyber operations. Um, and in those reports, they identify the offensive TTPs with attack, and they're starting to identify the recommended countermeasures using defend. Um, so there's a nice structure there that lets people sort of really, you know, understand the guidance um, for, from a, a model point of view. Um, we've seen, we've seen it apl being applied to environments, um, and, uh, I'll talk, I'll, I'll go through some examples of that. Um, and, and, you know, we've seen significant improvements in configuration changes in environments when you apply it to, and, and really just think about your defenses structurally. Um, folks are starting to cite it in academia and we're starting to see vendors also describe their, their capabilities using defend, which was one of the main sort of goals of the project, which is, you know, how do you better understand this vendor space? And I'm gonna talk about that in great detail. Um, and then interestingly, recently started noticing folks are starting to put it in, uh, in uh, job uh, listings. They're, 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 they're wanting folks to have familiarity with Defend. There's a small number, uh, but it's, it's, it, it, that's starting to kind of get some traction. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about what DEFEND actually is and why, um, but first I wanna talk about acronyms. Uh, our industry loves acronyms and it's for a reason and I'm gonna talk about that. But first I wanna go through some you might be familiar with. First we had firewalls, right? Then we had next-gen firewalls. Then we had IPSs. Then we had next-gen IPSs, AV. Next Gen AV, you might be seeing a pattern here. And we've got a lot of, of these things changing over time. EDR, NDR, now we've got XDR, and it keeps going. UBA, not to be confused with UEBA. I am, I dam, I cam, CASB, SACI, that's kind of a new one. Now we've got the latest, hottest acronym, Zero Trust Architecture, right? So I felt a little left out and I had to make up an acronym of my own, ALOT. 
And all these acronyms are describing this very complex vendor space and these implicit functions that they provide. Uh, consider the fact that there are thousands of cybersecurity vendors. Each of those vendors might have multiple products. And then each of those products might perform dozens of discrete functions. Um, so it's incredibly complex space. And on this chart, these are just some of the logos, not even what products they're offering necessarily. And then if you're a security architect, managing this stuff over time is incredibly complicated. The vendors keep uh, buying one another, uh, products get rebranded, capabilities are folded into bigger offerings. Um, and it's very difficult to keep track of this space. And I think that's why, you know, there, there's good employment opportunities in cybersecurity is it's hard to find people who can make sense of this complexity. And this is just the vendor specific technology for cybersecurity. Um, and, uh, you know, these are things that we usually bolt on to enterprises after the fact uh, or systems, um, you know, or industrial control systems, for example, we try to bolt on cyber after the fact. Um, but there's a whole nother domain too, which is uh, configuration policies and hardening and locking down your system. And this is configuring the underlying IT infrastructure uh, that you have. Some of these uh, technologies are providing services to the users. They're not really cybersecurity specific, but you have to configure them in such a way that makes it harder for attackers to abuse legitimate functionality. And this space is also incredibly complex. Um, each block on this diagram represents an entire policy document. And uh, you can imagine the, the amount of paper it would take to print these out. It would be uh, many trees, I, I presume, right? So it's very complex, but there's an interplay between these configurations and the cybersecurity specific technologies. So there's just a ton of complexity here. Um, so, um, you know, what does complexity really mean? It means it's a lot of money. Um, security, security budgets are, are typically 10% of total IT spend and consider the fact that some IT budgets are multi-billion dollars. So we're spending a lot of money on cybersecurity and rightfully so, but how do you know you're not wasting it? Um, well, from my, our perspective, the, the way that you uh, make sure you're, you're, you're spending your money wisely is you have to really understand what you're spending it on. And that's exactly why we built Defend. Um, what we did was we looked at the um, technology space uh, that's specific to cybersecurity, but also the uh, IT infrastructure itself. And we built this, what you see here is what we call um, the Defend Matrix. Um, and you can think of it as a taxonomy of cybersecurity functionality. So it's, fu it's organized by function. Um, and that's what lets us bridge the configuration space and the cybersecurity technology specific space, cyber defense technology. Um, we, we, we can start to ask that, answer that question is, you know, what is this thing really doing? Um, so across the top, it's the way that this is organized. Across the top, we have what we call defensive tactics. These are things, uh, high level sort of uh, maneuvers that you can perform to improve your um, defensive posture, things like hardening, detection, isolation, decept, deceive, evict. Um, we're gonna be adding some more. Um, one that we're working on now is uh, modeling and uh, sort of inventory, uh, um, you know, as, as sort of a top level category. Um, but you can see the, the tech section is, is the most built out. And part of that's because uh, that's sort of my background and the team's background. Um, but also uh, we felt like that space um, was, was you know, sort of the biggest opportunity to organize the functionality. Um, but as we started going through all these technology documents about how these things work, we started to identify other functions they perform. And that's you know, all these functions, we call these defensive techniques. One thing you'll note is we use the term defensive techniques, countermeasures, controls, mitigations. From our perspective, those are all synonyms. We just organize these things by function. Um, and then we name them in a predictable way 
um, you know, you can see there's generally a noun and a verb. Um, and all those things have definitions in the in the in the model that you can read and improve if, if they need it. Um, but we wanted it to be sort of predictable and have a methodology. So people are using Defend, uh, you know, when you're building a, a, a solution or an architecture, it's kind of like fitting together lots of pieces of the puzzle. Um, I'm going to talk about how people are using it. And kind of, it's interesting because people started all these different, um, from, from all these different places with different sets of data. Um, but before I talk about how people are using it, I'm gonna talk about uh, how we built it and how it works under the hood. So uh, defend is related to attack through this intermediate model that we call uh, digital artifacts. Um, I'm going to talk in depth about this, but basically we needed an explainable way to describe why one defensive technique or countermeasure uh, would address a particular threat or offensive technique or even weakness in a system. Um, and the way that we do this is we describe, you know, what are the digital artifacts in play uh, for both offense and defense independently. So you could imagine an offensive technique producing digital artifacts over time and defensive techniques observing those. Uh, that's sort of a simple view. Um, on the next uh, slide, I'm gonna show you uh, an exact specific example of each of these things. Um, and it's kind of like a blown up view here. So it's the same picture on the left, you've got the offensive techniques on the right, the defensive, and in the middle is this model we call uh, the digital artifact ontology. Um, the term ontology is, uh, I like to joke and say that's sort of a dangerous uh, word to use. Uh, it's a, it can sometimes be a quick way to, to, to get ignored in cybersecurity. Um, but I, so I wanna talk about that a little bit. Um, imagine you're trying to organize lots of complex information. Imagine three sort of categories of organization uh, ranging you know, increasing in, in sophistication. The first might be a list or dictionary of terms and definitions, right? The next would be a taxonomy or a, a that, and that's like a tree structure. So that's organized by types, right? Where uh, a dog is a type of mammal, which is a type of animal. And then each of those things would have definitions, right? That lets you group things. Well, the third level of organization is an ontology. Imagine that tree structure, but uh, multiple trees and then relationships between them. Now that creates a graph structure, but you could imagine a taxonomy of animals and then a taxonomy of behaviors. And you could say, well, a dog usually barks, right? Um, or things like that. So. It's really just, a, and that's why we call this a knowledge graph is because it creates a graph structure. Um, so like I said, on the left, we've got the offensive techniques as an example and the right, a defensive technique. And they're both related to this uh, digital artifact in the middle called a process code segment. And by this graphic, a process code segment is a type of code segment, which is a type of digital artifact. And then the blue lines indicate property relationships or has, you know, sort of like has a relationships. Uh, so a process contains process code segments. And what is a code segment? Um, well, it's, it's, that's a term that's used in computer science. Sometimes it's referred to as a text segment. It's a portion of an executable file that actually contains the instructions um, from the compiler. Um, but when a program launches on your computer, it copies those instructions into memory. So there's a distinction between um, the, the copy in memory versus the copy on disk. And for cybersecurity, these distinctions matter. Uh, process injection, for example, is modifying those code segments in the process, in the memory, but it's not necessarily touching the copy on disk where they originated from. And if you're a cyber defender, you have to and you want to secure each of those copies of this thing, you have to take different approaches, 
right? So that's why we get specific with these things. Um, then on the right, um, uh, we map in this, this defensive technique and it's verifying these process code segments. So because we're mapping both sides at a time uh, individually, we can then infer additional relationships through this graph. So never do I have to specify process code segment verification uh, mitigates or addresses process injection. We can infer that because we know that process code segment verification is used for detection. And we know that they're interacting with the same pieces and parts inside the computer. And that's really all this digital artifact ontology is doing. It's defining all the pieces and parts in the computer and their relationships to one another. Um, we've, uh, we have over 400 of them identified and defined and their relationships to one another. Um, and I suspect that will grow uh, significantly over time. I guess one thing I'll say is that um, it, it does, <laughs> the, the architecture of computers is a lot more stable than, you know, <laughs> so these, some of these, these concepts are pretty durable and that's why we think this approach is, is, is reasonable. Um, okay, so uh, now that we have this, how are people actually using it? Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, three different scenarios where people uh, are starting with different sets of information and their goal is to just improve their cyber defenses. Um, one thing we found is that as we go in and apply this, um, people are starting from different places. They have different roles. They have different data available to them. So consider the scenario where um, an organization has really good threat intelligence and it prioritizes what things they might want to uh, address first. Um, with that information through the graph, you can pivot from attack to defend and get your series of recommended uh, or potential countermeasures based on the, the components in the computer. Um, however, a lot of times we go in and people don't have tailored threat intelligence that's really actionable. Um, and, but they still want to do something. They want to improve their defenses. So what they'll do is say, well, here's my, my defensive capabilities. Uh, what could I detect? And are there any gaps in there that seem like we should really cover those? So what they do is you can break down your capabilities using defend and you know, what specific functions are being performed by all of your capabilities. Uh, and then from there, you get a, a, a notional threat coverage, which can be a controversial term, which um, we're going to get into more later. Um, but then they have a sense of what they might be able to detect. And then they can take those uh, maybes and turn them into a test plan and then actually test to see if their countermeasures work. Um, but there's another scenario where people don't have uh, threat intelligence and they don't have uh, any capabilities. They're building a completely new system. So how do you decide what to do? Um, well, if you, in your system design, and this is a bit of a more advanced use case for systems engineering, um, you can annotate, imagine sort of a, a, a systems drawing, right? Where you annotate each of the things in your drawing with what digital artifacts are inside, right? From there, for each component in your system, you can then determine, okay, here's the threats against this component. And then here are the uh, defenses that we might be able to apply to it, right? So all this information is available on the uh, De Defend website. Um, I'm gonna demo that. So I'm not gonna spend too much time going through the uh, screenshots here, but there are knowledge base articles um, this one is showing the write-up on process code segment verification. Um, the information we use to develop this content is uh, from a variety of sources. Um, in some cases, we look at source code on GitHub from vendors. Uh, in some cases, we look at academic papers uh, where there's implement where we know there's an implementation, um, and then. In a lot of it, you'll notice uh, we actually analyzed a variety of patents from uh, vendors. Um, I want this is a common point of confusion I want to uh, talk about, which is that you know defend is not trying to say that this vendor does this particular thing, nor nor 
characterize how well they do it. We're trying to develop the language and the, 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 the knowledge about the general categories of these functions. So um, if you see a patent in Defend, don't, don't think that, oh, this vendor definitely does this. They might do it. Um, and that's uh, sort of an exercise left to the, the, the user. We do have plans for coming up with uh, sort of a, a process by which people can claim uh, that they perform these functions. Um, but that's uh, future work. Um, there's also deep dives on all the digital artifacts. Like I said, we've got over 400 of them. Um, and then for each digital artifact uh, that we've modeled, you can see the related countermeasures and the related offensive techniques, um, and then relationships in the graph. Um, one thing I'll point out is the views that you see on the website do not represent the full model. The full model you need to download and open with a, um, a standards-based um, editor or viewer, and you can see everything. We show the most salient points on the website. Um, here's an example of how we've modeled um, a particular attack technique inside of Defend. Um, and this, I think, really illustrates sort of the challenges here. Um, and uh, this one is a tricky one, of course. It's uh, rootkit, which is an attack technique, and it's you know very difficult to uh, to plan to detect these things. Um, and that's sort of illustrated by you know if you look at that graph, you see the red box in the middle, and then relationships to the yellow boxes. The red box is the offensive technique. The yellow boxes are the uh, digital artifacts. And then the blue boxes are the potential countermeasures. Um, and you'll notice that the rootkit can install, uh, be installed in many different locations or muck with various things, ranging from kernel modules to shared library files to firmware uh, to the boot sector of a hard drive. Um, and if you're a defensive engineer, that's obviously a nightmare because you have to take radically different engineering approaches to deal with the diversity of this single offensive technique. Um, so I think that tells an interesting story there. Um, so uh, now I'm gonna kind of go through a more detailed, just to paint a picture visually here of what it looks like to go from one to the other and types of stories you're able to tell. Um, and then after this, I'm gonna demonstrate some of the new features to kind of help you manipulate data with Defend. Um, so here's a case where we had a particular threat. It was uh, called this Octopus Scanner malware, and there was open source reporting on this. And basically, they were infecting Git repositories with a malicious NetBeans configuration file, which NetBeans is an IDE. If you're not familiar, you know, it's like a text editor for software developers. Um, so every time the developers would check out the code, it would read the configuration file, and then their, their own text editor would download a malicious jar file from the internet um, and then run it, and now the adversary had access to the developer systems. And uh, uh, the, the sponsor wanted to know, would these three products I have address any of you know, these particular uh, threat actions, right? So what we did was we mapped on the left, the offensive technique, uh, the offensive uh, threat report sort of to uh, attack and sort of standard uh, procedure there. And then we broke down the uh, product's capabilities using defend into what are the specific defend techniques that this, these products do. And you can see on the right, there's these green boxes some were in the hardening category, some were in detection, and some were in isolation. And then we took each stage of the attack and said, could we have detected this or addressed it or prevented it? Um, and, and for initial access, potentially yes, but none of these three products did that. Um, if they had some application hardening or platform hardening, they may have been able to prevent it. Um, but they, they didn't have any. And then we did that for the rest of the stages of the attack. And then what's useful, I think, is you get these higher level insights about where you're making your investments, where are they paying off, um, and where you might want to uh, change things or improve things. And, and in general, 
Um, you know, this was sort of the first time we actually applied Defend, but getting these higher level insights and being able to explain to um, stakeholders, hey, here's where we need to make additional investments or move existing investments um, proved to be very useful. Um, and it really just highlighted that thinking about defense in a structured way is essential and important for telling the story to stakeholders. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no right way to apply defend in the sense that uh, there's no, you know, sort of deterministic answer about here's the perfect way to change your defenses. Um, you know, for example, it, you know, consider the consider if your organization has, and this might be rare, surplus money, you might take a different course of action than if you have, you know, uh, budget constraints, right? So it could be, you know, we're going to increase defense in depth, or where could we reallocate things? So radically different outcomes, but the same data, right? Um, all right, so. Now I'm going to kind of switch to uh, a live demo, but before I do that, I wanted to take a uh, a second to see if there are any questions we wanted to talk about. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm actually gonna jump in while you, while you're getting that set up. I'm gonna uh, hit a couple that people have asked, um, some of which I've answered uh, in in the stream, but they should be pretty quick to uh, to for you to answer. First one. <clears throat> Will there be a defend matrix for ICS, a specific defend for ICS? Is that in the roadmap currently, or is it not something that's currently on the on the docket to, in your work in your work list? It's 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 absolutely on the roadmap, um, and uh, I will say that a lot of defend applies to ICS right now. There are things that um, are unique to ICS, but you know, as we all know, especially on the physical side, um, but at the same time, on, on the in the in digital space, you know, a lot of these controllers are they're they're running Linux, right? And we have to secure those. Um, and if there's anyone out there who is um, particularly interested in contributing to that or participating in that, please reach out and we'll talk about how to engage. But that's a great opportunity to accelerate that area in Defend. Yep. Okay. Um, there was a question correlation between attack and offend, defend. I think that you've addressed that in terms of the mapping, but a related question are defend countermeasures updated at the same pace as attack or vice versa? Are these projects linked uh, internally with MITRE or are they in some way um, insulated from one another and independently releasing updates? So th they are two separate project teams. Um, and uh, what we try to do is, you know, Attack releases uh, new versions a couple times a year, and we try to get a an update of Defend out there to add the new um, the new attack techniques and and deal with deprecated ones, um, you know, in a reasonable amount of time. So we try, you know, we're trying to keep them uh, in sync um, in that way, and. Um, uh, you know, right now, I will say that we have not upgraded, uh, you know, to attack 11 yet. It's still m mostly focused on attack 10. So you may notice that, uh, but shortly they'll all be in there and uh, updated. So. Yep. And then the last one, um, the, the question is, couldn't I just use detect to do this type of mapping? Um, of attack technique to products and security solutions. So, so what's the gap between detect and defend and what you're doing um, that is different or how does the ontology help in that case? Uh, that's a good question. I, I would say that, um, you know, we're focused on building the, the, the model of infrastructure behind the scenes um, and, so far, that's paid significant dividends. Um, in addition, you know, a, a, we're going for a comprehensive taxonomy of defensive functionality. And that's um, to include things that an engineer at Intel is doing to make it harder to, you know, uh, hack a system. So I, I think the target audiences are a bit different. Um, and you'll see defend, um, you know, while the detection side is, is the most built out at the moment, other areas, it's going to, you know, 
you know, really the goal is to connect operations and engineering, right, with this thing. And I think that's that's what makes this unique. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah, go go with that. We've got a few more questions still in the queue, but we'll get to those after your uh, after your live demo of, of walking through it. All right, great. So, um, so as I mentioned, you can use the website to kind of you can quickly look up attack techniques here. You know, I'll search for rootkit, um, and this is the same view I, I talked about in the slides. Um, you can search by digital artifact, like what is a kernel. In, in what does that mean in defend, right? And you can click that and you get um, a definition on all the terms and then how it's related to other terms. So this is sort of like a uh, miniature graph of where this lives in, we call it sort of the neighborhood of, of this concept. Um, the, the, the full graph is much bigger, but you'll notice we don't represent like some big, uh, you know, spaghetti ball. <laughs> um, so a kernel contains things like hardware drivers, uh, may, might contain kernel modules and, and all these relationships, which you can also browse, right? Um, one other thing, all these search boxes deal with synonyms. So like, for example, if you look up defend techniques and you type in malware sandbox, uh, you'll get a match for dynamic analysis, which is our term for it. And then you can click that. Um, now, some of the new features we released, um, we're calling these extractors. So uh, this defend extractor. So the reason we developed this is because we, we, you know, we, we keep going into environments and people are like, well, what could we detect in, and with what we have? Um, and it's kind of difficult to, uh, <laughs> to answer those questions in a reasonable fashion. So we wanted to kind of really quickly be able to, from any format quickly extract what are the functions being performed and then automatically map them to uh, attack. So I'll use an example here. There's one vendor um, who I hadn't heard of um, before they published this blog post last year. Um, and and they, they said, you know, what MITRE defend techniques do we implement? And uh, what I'll do is I'll just uh, command command A or control A, copy all the text. I've got my zoom bar here helping me out. Um, I'll paste that into here and hit go. And it pulled out 11 defend techniques. Um, it will pull out synonyms, identifiers, uh, ontology identifiers, or you know, defend IDs. Um, and, uh, then down here, it also maps them automatically to attack. So URL analysis, for example, now here's where you can kind of understand the full story about why we think this will address a particular attack technique. URL analysis, you'll notice there's a defensive verb and a defensive artifact, and then an offensive verb and an offensive artifact. Sometimes they'll be the same, but sometimes they won't. And I'll show examples of that. But in this case, it's the same. Um, URL analysis analyzes URLs. This attack technique drive by compromise T1189 produces URLs and thus there's a match. So we could say, okay, would this catch that? And maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't, depending on how your architecture is set up and how the traffic's going. Um, there's a disclaimer about these relationships. But the thing that we're trying to do is, is really just kind of provide that first high level, here's all the maybes. Um, and the reason I think you know, that's useful is that um, everyone has special, you know, sort of specialized knowledge in a particular domain. Um, but, um, you know, cybersecurity is such a broad domain, it's, it's impossible for anyone to be an expert in all the areas. So the goal here with this is that we are combining all the common knowledge or common sense and putting it into one thing. And that's really what we're trying to do. Um, so for example, uh, down here, you'll see matches in the case of dynamic analysis with something like uh, 
you know, let's pick one. Dynamic analysis analyzes uh, executable files. And this offensive technique is interpreting executable scripts. So here's a case where an executable script is a type of executable file. And that's why there's a match. So it's not a one-to-one -one match. It takes into account the, the, the actual model or ontology. So you can click on, you know, what's an executable script and you get a definition for that. Uh, and then up here, you'll notice, okay, that's a type of executable file, right? Um, you can also uh, export the results in um, a number of ways to work with this. It's just to sort of accelerate things. You can copy and paste it into an Excel book and get your, uh, you know, a nicely formatted table. Um, or you can also click download and uh, download a, a navigator layer. And then um, if you're familiar with the tech navigator, you can open that up and then get a sense of what the hypothetical coverage of these variety of techniques might be. The real goal here is to give you a, a starting place to kind of um, you know, build a test plan or have deeper conversations with the vendors to figure out, well, this might detect this, but you know, would it actually do that in, in, in a certain scenario? So, um, so we just went from a vendor's you know, web page to um, what things are in there and then being able to visualize that here um, with a, a navigator layer. Um, if you hover over the, uh, the attack techniques, it'll show you what defensive techniques match. So native API, uh, under execution uh, might be detected by system call analysis, for example, which is a defend technique, right? Um, you could go the other way too. You could go uh, what we call the uh, attack extractor. I'll take a threat intel report. Um, this one was the uh, one produced by uh, NSA, CISA, and FBI. And I can copy all the text in here. One thing I'll note is the various PDF viewers handle copy and paste differently sometimes. So um, you may only get one page when you're copying things. Um, but um, so I copied that, all the text from the 30 page report, pulled it out. Here's all the attack techniques. And then uh, here's all the related defend techniques for each of those single attack techniques. You know, where I showed you before is a one-to-many relationship from defense to offense, same for, for, same for offense to defense. Um, in this case, a drive-by comprom compromise uh, produces outbound internet network traffic. And uh, these defend, defend techniques are analyzing network traffic. So the way that we define things in defend is we say if a defensive technique if we declare that it analyzes network traffic, that's the same as saying it analyzes all types of network traffic. Um, there are reasons we've done it that way. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's sometimes quite difficult to specify, well, what exactly, what types of network traffic is something that's designed to do generic analysis doing? Um, which uh, there, there's another point there to make too, which is that you know, if you look at the, uh, the defend matrix, um, all of these functions that we've defined uh, can be implemented in so many different ways. Um, they could be done manually by uh, an analyst or an operator, um, or they could be implemented in software with, um, you know, running on, on a client device in real time. Um, so uh, don't think that, you know, all these things are just things that you could buy. Uh, a lot of these can, uh, these can be used to characterize analytics you're developing that are, you're, you're running in SIM tools and things like that. So for example, if you write a, a, a query for your SIM, that's looking at, uh, you know, the properties of uh, process spawns in your environment, we would call that in defend process spawn analysis, right? And you can then catalog and uh, organize sort of all the different things you're doing and developing from a functional perspective. And that can provide you insights over time. Well, gee, over the last month, 
um, every single analytic I've written was look, you know, was looking at process spawns. Is there a, a mathematical way we might want to look at process spawns in our environment rather than doing rigid string matching, right? So, just some ideas to think about um, when you're using this. Peter, can I get you to go back to the attack extractor tab that's at the top in the center that you just had up a second ago? Because I wanted to ask you just to make the point again. Mm -hmm. So in here, this attack extractor is pulling from that document the attack references. But in that same document, and this is the one that you highlighted that, there's also defend references. So I just want you to explain how you would need to use that defend extractor again in this case in order to make sure that you're going both directions uh if you don't mind explaining sure. that just for clarity for people uh listening so um it, that's right in that report i showed there they actually had mapped uh to uh defend so i'll show that here um and this is where one point i like to make too is um you know, this was kind of, it was pretty, I like how they structured this one because um, they put, you know, on uh, appendix A of this report on page six, um, they have this table with four columns. On the, on the left column, they've got the offensive techniques and their identifiers. On the right, they've got the defensive techniques they recommend and their identifiers. But the real meat is in the middle, which is specific details about how this technique was being implemented uh, by the actor and how to tailor the defend techniques to um, this particular threat. And this is, in my opinion, where the real hard work is, is in these useful details. And I do, you know, I am, we're, I'm definitely proud of the work that we've done on, on defend. But at the end of the day, it's providing categories for you to use and better understand your space. But the real hard work is in tailoring those concepts to your environment with specific information um, that only you have. Uh, and, um, and that's where that, you know, that that's the hard work in my view. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the demonstration here was in the case that, that, that this report did not have defend technique specified, you might want to uh, pull it out that way. But um, just for fun, I can kind of show you what that would look like if we run the same data from that report through the defend extractor, right? And then you can see, okay, well, the NSA was recommending 41 particular defend techniques uh, in that one report. Now, this was a big report that, you know, but, you know, per the report, was uh, you know an analysis over over a very long period of time, right? So <laughs> to get just to scope that, um, that's that's great. I, I appreciate you sort of showing that from both directions and also um, acknowledging that like the the hard work in there of the analysis of the information is is present. And what Defend is really trying to do is to provide to bring rigor and uh, specific um, mappings, and you call it an ontology, which is a you know, fancy word describing the notion of mappings across um, tree structures, right? But you're providing that so that analysts now have a mechanism by which we can have consistency in describing our thinking and be able to expose the work, which is a huge challenge in performing analysis. So do you mind if I uh, throw a couple more questions in? Because there's some really go ahead. there's some really good questions in here. Michael asks a good question, and it's it's a, a challenging question, which I think challenging questions is, are, are great ones. And so to set the stage of the question, he says, "Look, um, uh, recently a prominent security professional, so I don't know who that is, but um, said basically, defend is destined to fail." And so his his question is, in your opinion, what valid criticisms? would create the circumstance where defend does fail like what what are the conditions for you that you think that this that this project that you're undertaking currently what are the conditions where this would ultimately be superseded or just neglected as not being useful like and i think that's the question that he's asking great question um you know my first response is uh i'd i'd want to understand fail at what Right. And, um, you know, from my perspective, 
you know, we've already applied it in multiple places to great effect. Um, and getting people to think in a different way about their architecture has caused them to physically change what they're doing, right? And, and to improve it. Um, in terms of valid criticisms, um, you know, whenever you're building an abstraction or a model, uh, it, it has to be, it, it, by definition, it's, it's wrong. It, 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 if it was just representing all of reality, that's not a model or an abstraction. Um, and the challenge, and this is the same in machine learning, where um, you know, it, 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 if it knew every case, um, that's, not, that's not an actual model. And thus, you can't predict uh, using that information. Um, so the question is, what's the right level of abstraction and you know, error in what you're building? Um, with something like this, we have to generalize. That's both the value and the, the weakness, right? Because if the generalization is not useful, then what was the point? Um, so um, now this is because this is a trade-off type situation, um, we have to uh, figure out where's the sweet spot where we, we don't overgeneralize, uh, but we also don't undergeneralize and when we're defining things um, and categorizing things. So um, in my view, the only way to really do that is to put it out there, get feedback. Um, you know, I don't know if I, you know, whether or not you believe in destiny is one thing, um, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, you know, from my perspective, the team is really, um, you know, interested and excited to receive feedback and um, contributions and things like that. We've already been receiving a fair amount of feedback on our GitHub. Um, so um, I'm not sure if that fully answers the question, but that's my best shot. Yeah, well, let me, um, let me um, ask the second part of the question. And, uh, you know, so the first part of it was more from the, what's the valid criticism? What sort of challenges are there? And then the other part of it is, how is MITRE addressing present day shortcomings to ensure long-term success of this knowledge base? And you started to answer that, but you want to talk a little bit about what the project is doing and how you're getting that feedback and how right. you're applying it um, in order to talk about MITRE's investment in this as a, as a project. So um, one point I want to make is, is also the, the uh, our, we're being funded by, um, by, by the NSA to do this work. Uh, MITRE does uh, lead the work. Um, and the goal here is to open source this, get the feedback from the community. Um, and we're doing that through a number of ways. Um, like I said, you know, we just released this uh, less than a year ago. Um, we've released a variety of updates and all those updates have um, been uh, driven by direct user feedback. Those people are listed on the contributors page on Defend. Um, and uh, one thing we're doing in the near term is open sourcing even more of the code. So the code used to produce this um, is uh, uh, an application stack. Um, we've open sourced the ontology files and the build system for the ontology. Mm -hmm. And we're already getting um, pull requests from people and, uh, you know, from other countries and, and they, uh, so I, I think we're scratching an itch. Um, my, my goal is to keep the project sort of efficiently using resources. Uh, we're a very small team, uh, building this. Uh, and, um, I think if we can stay efficient, figure out how to scale the, the, the development of this model via GitHub, and you know the Slack channel. Um, I think it's it's going to be sustainable and and useful over time. Great. Um, there there are several other questions, so I'm going to ask these kind of quickly. Um, one question is: 
D for tool functionality is described in terms like artifact preservation, collection, validation, processing, and evidence, identification, extraction, presentation. But these terms don't obviously appear in DEFEND. Uh, in your opinion, is DEFEND suitable for assessing um, digital forensics tools specifically? That's a great question. Um, so when you're doing a product assessment or tool assessment, there are so many dimensions of things you have to consider. Um, and that was one of the sort of the impetus for this project was I was doing a comparison of, of commercial products and I had a hundred point sort of checklist of things I wanted to know about each product. And then I had, I started with 30 products. I whittled it down to eight products. So that's still 800 points of data that you're collecting. And I felt, wow, there's no enumeration of all the cybersecurity functionality out there. So most of the things we were comparing were like administrative features and things like that. So um, product analyses are highly dimensional um, and uh, defend functions in those products are one uh, single uh, dimension. Uh, however, as you characterize those defend techniques in the product, those often have their own dimensions, things like false positive rates or cost or, you know, computational cost. So um, for defer tools who uh, are doing analysis and trying to detect things, there may be application on the functions in defend. Uh, the artifacts in defend for defer tools uh, should be relevant. It's a pretty large taxonomy of these things. Um, but the specific defer tool functions that are like, you know, part of the incident response workflows, those, those administrative functions are sort of would be a, a parallel taxonomy, if that makes sense. Yep, it, it makes sense to me and hopefully to the respond <laughs> to the person who asked the, the question too. Um, you were talking about, uh, you were talking about um, data sources, and there are a couple of questions in here around data sources. So let me let me say th these two questions, and then you can you can answer it. And this might be our last one. Uh, so the first question is: Can attack data sources, the specific attack data sources reference, uh, be matched to a defend ID? Um, and the second question related to this: Could procedural variances in the attack techniques change what subcomponent data sources are relevant? in the mapping defend techniques in the, or in the mapped defend techniques. So those two questions are kind of related to data sources. So some of the attack data sources could be related to our artifacts for sure. And there would hopefully be some linkage there. Um, with regard to the procedural variations, um, yes, th that's, that is the problem is that depending on how the, the offensive technique is implemented, um, it could be in many different ways, and then as the as the architect, you know, you know, or the uh, uh, or the DCO, you know, operator or SOC operator, you know, you, you're going to have to understand exactly what it's doing if you want to detect it. Um, so, um, but at the end of the day, that procedure is going to be a, a doing something to the specific part in the computer, and that would be the digital artifact in our model. And then if you understand that, then you can figure out what defensive technique might apply. Great. Um, I, I have one question that I wanna put out there. There are a couple of other in there, but I'm gonna be selfish and, and ask my question. So um, basically in, in our discussions, um, you've talked about two um, sort of big categories of people who you see using this. One is the cybersecurity blue team operators, right? And you just mentioned DCO, defensive cyber operations, like the, those sorts of people. The other big category of people are the engineers, the cybersecurity architects, the cybersecurity engineers. Talk a little bit about how you expect each of them to use it. And if it were up to you and your growth path going forward, who else would you include in the mix? Great question. Um, well, that's, so there's two, there's two ways I wanna answer that. One is, is uh, there's a term emerging called digital engineer. And uh, that's from the discipline of systems engineering, which is a whole formal discipline. And these people are not cybersecurity focused, right? But they're the ones designing the systems. 
So if they can start to design in hooks for cybersecurity in earlier in the system's development life cycle, you can introduce changes when it's um, less expensive. Now this may, uh, this, this is going to be, you know, different depending on the type of environment. If you're, if you're in an enterprise environment, that's a lot different than if you're building like, you know, a, 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 like the Mars rover or something like that, right? It's, so, but, but they're all running IT infrastructures. <laughs> so, um, so the audience for digital engineers, the reason why they like the ontology and that formal approach is that it gives them a, cons a consistent way to anchor all these various concepts and competing interests and um, organize their designs and make better decisions up front. So that, from my perspective, until we can engage these other audiences as, um, you know, you know, as security, as cybersecurity professionals, um, we're gonna we're gonna be bolting on our things always after the fact, right? So, you know, my my hope is that Defend helps bridge those two completely different communities, um, and then you know the other people I think that can benefit are the people who are managing purchases of these capabilities. Um, so acquisitions folks, um, because we've or organized it as that tree structure or taxonomy, uh, maybe the acquisition folks just care about the high level categories, right? And then the engineers care about the lower level techniques, but because they're using the same language, you can track statistics on acquisitions over time and then maybe one day be able to answer, well, did our investment in this cybersecurity thing actually pay off? Um, and, you know, I hope that, you know, we can start to answer questions like, you know, is this thing working, <laughs> uh, you know, in, in, in sort of this a, a comprehensive, you know, um, uh, sort of modeling based approach, right? Um, yeah, so that, there's my uh, thoughts there. That's great. We're actually out of time. I've got several other questions. So I'm um, sorry for folks who didn't get their questions answered. There was a question in here that I do want to address, Peter. How do people get in touch with you? Um, what's the best way if they want to talk to you about stuff that's inside of uh, Defend? Great question. Um, so if you go on the Defend website, you can, uh, there's a number of ways to contact us, email. There's the, uh, the Slack channel, which is now on the website. You can join. Um, and uh, then we've, of course, got GitHub. So feel free to reach out on any of those. We are um, we'll, uh, energetic in terms of engaging folks on all these different ways. And we're very excited to collaborate uh, with anyone who's interested on this. So please reach out and um, say hi. Great, awesome. Yeah, and, and James who asked the question said he can't do GitHub, he can't do a couple of other things. So the email address might be the you know, lowest common denominator strategy there for that. So that's on the screen now as well. Uh, we're a little bit over time, but Peter, thank you very much for the time and insight and sharing the thoughts and answering the questions. That was a, a great talk. It's exactly what I had in mind. I tried to do this last December, I think was when we started this, like November, December of right, last year right. when it first came out. And I'm happy actually that it, it's now because you've been able to develop it some more. So keep going. Um, it's a useful, uh, useful effort. And uh, thanks to everybody who tuned in today. Um, Randall, you want to uh, wrap things up? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, just read it. Thank you both very much, Chris and Peter, for this presentation on Defend and bringing this content to uh, our SANS community. Uh, yeah, MITRE is really doing such awesome work. And I think we're all very, very glad for it and appreciative. So thanks again. Um, to our audience, thank you very much for joining us. For a schedule of all upcoming and on-demand SANS webcasts, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. And in the meantime, take care, and we hope to have you again sometime. Bye for now. Thank you.